All right, hello everybody. Th my name is Brant Fotts. Uh, thank you for coming down tonight to join us at the uh, Center for Wooden Boats for the third Friday speaker series, CWB's longest running program. And uh, hello everybody on Zoom. Uh, thanks for joining us as well. So um, this is uh, navig navigating the voyage to a cruising life. And the approach I'd like to take tonight is I'm gonna sort of describe a sort of a general framework for how you can think about getting to, to a cruising life. And I, some of you probably are already cruisers. Actually, for the people in the room, how many of you are currently boaters? Okay, so a lot of, a lot of uh, new boaters thinking about going cruising. Excellent. And how many? Yeah. Can I just take your mic? Oops, a little bit of. Yeah, just a little bit too much contact with your um, blouse. So go like that. My blouse, excellent. Okay. okay um, so I'm going to describe this sort of general, simple framework for thinking about how you can get yourself into a life of, of uh, long distance voyaging or even short distance voyaging on a, on a sailboat or it could be a powerboat. And then I'm going to carry you through sort of my own personal experience down through the years and how it kind of played out for me. But there's a lot of different ways to, to go cruising. And um, kind of at the end, I'll describe uh, what I've seen out while I've been cruising uh, in sort of the different styles of, of doing it. So um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been sailing since the mid-1980s, and um, I've cruised a little over 20,000 miles. I've been as far north as Glacier Bay in southeast Alaska, and as far south as um, uh, the Sea of Cortez. Um, I'm really just getting started in my long distance voyaging, but as you'll see as this kind of unfolds, it's kind of gone gradually uh, through, the, through the years, and so I've really been cruising for a long time. What I'm currently doing is I'm spending six months south of the border. Boat's currently in Mexico. It's going to keep on going. Uh, and then I, I spend six months uh, in uh, Port Townsend, where I live now. So this is kind of what we're talking about. Close your eyes and imagine cruising. You picture your boat in an exotic location all by itself. This is actually a really crowded uh, anchorage. There is another boat. Um, <laughs> that, that's in the Sea of Cortez, a little place called uh, Honeymoon Cove on Isla Danzante. Uh, and it's um, maybe a third of the way north as you're going up the Sea of Cortez uh, in between Baja and mainland Mexico. And so how do you get here? Well, there's a lot to learn. And uh, this is not an exhaustive list. But you need to learn to handle a boat. If you're going to do it on a sailboat, you've got to learn to sail. You know, pretty obvious stuff. Navigation, um, how do you avoid uh, running into each other? So what are the rules of the road? Uh, you really need to understand how the weather works, how to anchor, how to maintain the boat. This is a big deal. Whenever I'm talking to somebody who's thinking about buying a boat, Mike is laughing because he's owned several boats. Um, you, uh, I, I first ask, are, do you like working on the boat as much as you like using the boat? And if the answer is yes, great. Go ahead and buy a boat. Hi, Bill. Hello, Robin. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, and if the answer is no, I don't really want to work on a boat. That's why you have friends with boats, <laughs> which can also be described as the enlightened, the people that sail on their friends' boats. But some of us are crazy, and we like to do this ourselves. Strongly endorsed. <laughs> and spoken from an enlightened fan. Um, Resource management, so you have scar everything's a scarce resource on a boat. Your water is in tanks, your fuel is in tanks. Um, you can make water if you have a water maker, but you need electricity, so you have to generate the electricity, and on and on, right? Um, crew management and safety, this is really key. Uh, somebody has to be the skipper of the boat, and that person is responsible to make sure everybody's safe. Reporting in progress. Good. And it's also, um, you're responsible to make sure everybody's having a good time and is comfortable as well, so, and then you're responsible for the boat itself. Uh, communications, um, health and first aid, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and something goes wrong, you just have to be ready to deal with it. So you gotta have a little bit of ability to take care of that. And there's a whole bunch more, and one of the things I really love about this sport avocation lifestyle is it never ends. You can spend your entire life and never learn everything there is to learn. It's a fantastic way to go. So here's kind of a simple, simple framework. If you think of this uh, in terms of kind of five stages, 
And the stages, as you'll see, aren't necessarily completely linear, but it's a way to kind of simple, a simple way of thinking about it. You got to get started. So start, start sailing, or you know, if you're going to use a powerboat, start learning how to handle the boat, learn the basics. Then, very quickly, I would recommend um, starting to build your sailing network. And I'm gonna, just going to keep sail, say, saying sailing because I'm a sailor, and if you're right, so um, start to build your 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 network of sailing buddies so you can go crew on their boats uh, as much as possible, and then you can learn from the experience of sailing with somebody who maybe has more experience. And um, you know, one way to do that, if you're interested in this kind of thing, is to get into the racing uh, community. There's a really active racing community in Puget Sound, and people are always looking for crew. Uh, and actually, the last month's Third Pr Friday Speaker Series event was on uh, getting into the racing community. It was uh, presented by Melanie Masson, who's the development director here at the Center for Wooden Boats. So if you're interested in racing, Check out that it's on. It's available on YouTube, and it's also on the um, podcast on the CWB website. So, at some point, you probably want to get a boat. It is actually possible to cruise without having your own boat, and I'm going to talk about a couple of ways that, that works. Uh, but if you get your own boat, then you start to have the experience of being responsible for everything that goes on the boat, taking care of the boat itself, and then you can start just building experiences. So, the first cruise, you know, one of my favorite. You can call it a cruise, even though it only happens during a day. It's just to sail across the sound over to Bainbridge Island, go to the pub, have fish and chips, and sail back. You know, bring a group along, and it's it's fun. Work up from that. Go to uh, Blake Island for a weekend. Take a week and sail up to the San Juans. We have a thousand miles as the crows fly of inside passage between here and Juneau and Glacier Bay in Southeast Alaska. You can cruise for a lifetime and keep expanding and never leave the inside passage. We are fortunate to live in one of the best cruising grounds in the world here uh, in the Puget Sound area. So keep expanding the experience. And then some, at some point you might find that you're ready to cut the dock lines and go off on a long distance voyage. So the way this played out for me, uh, it started in the mid 1980s. Um, I just graduated from college and a couple of my college buddies and I went on a scuba diving trip in uh, Australia, and we stopped in French Polynesia along the way. And I distinctly remember standing on a wharf in Papiete, the capital of uh, Tahiti, looking at this leathery French guy in a Speedo standing in the back of the sailboat and thinking, what, How did, did he really sail that boat here from what, France or the mainland US? So that got me thinking, and I, I talked my uh, traveling companions into getting a bunch of other people together um, and, um, and chartering a, a boat in the Caribbean. So that's this boat I'm showing on the picture here. It's a boat called Palu. It's a 75 foot wooden catamaran. Uh, that is the wooden boat that changed my life because after a week of sailing around, diving off the boat, um, sleeping in the nets uh, and diving under the jib when it rained, um, sticking a, a visa card in my swimsuit and swimming, swimming up to the bar, I thought, I got to have more of this in my life, right? This is fun. Yeah. Um, by the way, cruising is not a vacation. More, more on that later. Cruising is a lifestyle and there's work involved with it, uh, but you'll, you'll hear lots about that. Anyway, so after that trip, uh, I came home and I was living in Colorado at the time and bought my first sailboat, which was a, a Hobie Cat 16 looked exactly like the one pictured here. And um, so now I had my own boat. It's a small boat. And I, I would really encourage you, particularly uh, those of you starting out, um, get out and sail on a small boat first because it allows you to really get a feel for steering, a, a sense of riding the wind. Um, it's a way to be responsible for something that's not too big. You can get into trouble because it's a little boat, you get into a little trouble. Uh, you still need to be conscious of things like drowning and hypothermia. So wear your PFD, um, personal flotation device, if you're not familiar with the acronym, and um, you know be, be safety conscious. But it's it's a great way to get started out. And even if you're you know already in the racing circuit uh, and you're crewing on big boats, it's great to get out in a little boat um, and just get in touch with the physical sensation of managing this little boat. 
And this is a great place to do that, by the way. These boats right over here, if you may or may not be familiar, are for rent, and you can get lessons and that sort of thing. So there is, speaking of which, uh, a lot of opportunity for formal instruction. And Center for Wooden Boats is, is one of the places here. Um, I am personally um, very fond of this place. It's been a part of my life for a very long time. Uh, I worked here for a while. Um, but there's other places too, Sand, Sail Sandpoint on Lake Washington, Windworks out in uh, Shoal Shoal, uh, all the way down to uh, things like the uh, U.S. Maritime Academy, where you can get a Coast Guard captain's license. That's uh, he's teaching that online at the moment. And also these things like offshore sailing classes and cruising uh, classes where you make a vacation out of it and then you get on with a, a skipper instructor who will teach you ocean sailing or teach you uh, about cruising. So there's tons of these opportunities available. I took one set of lessons on a Hobie Cat in the Florida Keys and then learned all from my friends and also, um, and just doing it myself and gradually working my way up. But also I did a ton of reading and there are thousands of books uh, on this subject. I've just listed a few uh, key ones that I have found re really useful. If you're first starting out, there's this book called uh, Chapman's Piloting and Small Boat Handling. It's an excellent place to start because it just gives you a very kind of simple view of the whole picture, everything you kind of need to know about boating, um, sailing or power boating. And then you can start to drill down on the details and, and flesh out your, your knowledge. US chart number one is just the, um, the legend for reading US nautical charts and navigation is a really important aspect of cruising. So that's just a nice reference to have. When you buy a boat, Every boat owner needs to have a copy of Boat Owner's Mechanical and Electrical Manual by Nigel Calder. Um, anybody own a boat and not have that? Don't raise your hand, it'll be embarrassing. You don't have it, you gotta buy that. <laughs> I'll get you one. Uh, When's your birthday? Right. Yeah, you'll, you'll end up with it. Something will break, you won't know how to fix it, you go out and buy the boat. Well, it's okay. That sounds enlightened actually. Um, sorry, Wim was saying he borrows the book for those uh, not in the room. And then the other two, desirable and undesirable characteristics of offshore yachts. This is just a, one that I really like. Um, it was published in 1987. And so it's an older book, but it was created as a kind of a solution to a problem that manifests itself in the Fastnet race of 1979. That's a race um, uh, from Southern England out around the Fastnet Rock in Southern Ireland and back. And there was a disaster, there's a huge storm that um, caused a lot of loss of life and a bunch of boats capsized. And it was, a lot of it was because the boats, because they were designed to a particular racing rule were not really seaworthy, not really ocean worthy. So some experts in the field got together and came up with what are the things you're looking for, for a boat you're gonna take out into the ocean. So if you're thinking about buying a long distance voyaging boat, this is a great reference. Not much I think has changed in terms of, the, of what works. And then world cruising routes, basically um, anywhere you wanna go in the world, this guy, Jimmy Cornell has already been there in his boat and he will tell you um, what is the climate window that you wanna use. So the climate, think of climate window is what time of year is, are the conditions gonna be favorable for me to go to, from the point A that I wanna go from to the point B that I wanna go to. I'll, I'll talk more about weather and climate windows uh, in a little while. So back to kind of my experience in the early 90s, I was uh, living in Colorado, traveling to the San Francisco Bay Area a lot on business. And I met a, a coworker there, his name was Mike Chambro. He had a Cal 34 sailboat um, called Impetuous. And what I would do is stick around for the weekend and go sailing with Mike on, uh, on Impetuous. And that was my first experience with saltwater. Um, also a first experience on a bigger boat, a keel boat, uh, like the Cal 34, it's a 30 foot, four foot boat. Uh, got exposed to the tides because the tides run to six knots and more and the boat only does about five, six knots. So you kind of need to know what you're doing or you can get washed out into the ocean. We did sail under the Golden Gate Bridge out into the ocean, into the big waves. And I got a little bit of a taste for that and discovered that I wanted more. Um, so, uh, and that went on for, for several years. Um, and I remember telling Mike, I was thinking about buying a boat and he said, oh, it's a big responsibility, you shouldn't do it. 
But in 1997, I moved to Seattle and I purchased um, an Ericsson 38 sailboat called Priya. And that is still the boat that I'm cruising on today. Uh, it is the boat that's pictured here. And started sailing it around uh, the Puget Sound area. So now I've got my own boat sailing on the saltwater and I'm starting to learn that I really need to pay attention to the weather. There's weather forecasts, but I also wanted to try to understand how the weather really works. So I started stud studying weather. And um, there's kind of the big weather, what's going on out in the ocean. And then there's the microclimates, all the funky stuff that's happening inland. So that was quite a learning experience. Also tides. So our tides around here run to, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 feet on a big spring tide. So when you're anchoring, it's nice to know that the water's going to go up and down 17 feet, right? Uh, and they create currents. And so the difference in uh, navigating from, for example, from Seattle to Port Townsend and back in this boat, if I'm going with the tide on a strong, you know, spring tide, the strong days, I can get there in about five or six hours. If I was to do that against the same tide, it can take 10 or 12 hours. So um, got, to, got to start experiencing that. Then that um, kind of multiplied dramatically in 2000 when I took a leave of absence from my job and uh, took off for Southeast Alaska. Um, got as far, uh, well, this, this is a picture of Priya in, in Glacier Bay. So now you'll get some serious coastal navigation. And it's not just a matter of, you know, you can get a, you can get a, a GPS chart plotter that just shows you the chart and shows you your boat on the chart, right? So it's navigating is like a video game, except that when you're in Southeast Alaska, the charts aren't accurate and precise enough. So I, there were many times that my boat was shown on the chart as being on land when I was still in the water. And when you get um, it, around here, the charts are super accurate. But I, also down in Mexico, where the boat is now, um, you know, it can be off by a few miles. So there's traditional navigation um, techniques, like what's called lines of position, where you look at a landmark over there, you look at another, another one over there, and another one over there, and you draw a line, and it makes a little triangle on the chart, and you're somewhere in that triangle. So there's lots of um, techniques like that that you can learn, which are really important if you're going to cruise to exotic locations, which is kind of what this talk is about. Yeah, I also um, started to learn about how do you live on a boat for an extended period of time uh, and try to get along with your crew? And how do you provision the, for you know, being away, away from land for a few weeks um, and fit all that stuff in a small boat? And, you know, just sort of on and on in that. So what we, what we would typically do is we, we would cruise for about two weeks, hopping from anchorage to anchorage and then land in a, um, a small town, like for example, Wrangell, Alaska, or Petersburg, Alaska, immediately change the oil in the diesel engine, fix whatever's broken on the boat, which is usually two or three things, and then do the laundry and get groceries and go find a place to get a burger and then, and then move on. So the boat maintenance in exotic, cruising is boat maintenance in exotic locations. That, that's what we <laughs> Then fast forward another 10 years and the boat that was moored next to my boat in uh, Shilshol Bay Marina, uh, it was a Nordic 40 called Taking Flight. And uh, Dave and Ann and um, their five-year-old daughter, Kara, were getting ready to start a three-year voyage. They went down the west coast of North America through the Panama Canal, across the Caribbean and, and up the east coast to uh, Sag Harbor, New York, where she had a family house and they, they live now. They invited me to come uh, crew with them on their Seattle to San Francisco ride. And I did, it was a week long ocean passage. So I got the chance to see how, how do you plan a passage? How do you plan for the weather? Um, how do you set up a watch schedule? So there were three of us uh, exchanging watch watches, It'd be one person on at a time. Um, so I got exposed to all of that. And the thing is, that kind of opportunity is more available than you might think. I mean, to get to the point where somebody will take you on as crew on an ocean-going vessel, usually you have to know how to sail 
but before you get into that, but not always. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that later. Uh, but again, this is back to that idea of build up your crew network, find people to sail with and find opportunities to get out and get the experience. This is uh, a video and sorry, it'll be a little choppy on the Zoom probably, but uh, when I went to, uh, well, in 2013, uh, Dave and Ann were down in Panama. Uh, they had gone through the canal, they're on the north side, and they wanted to sail up to uh, Isla Mujeres in Mexico, which is near Cancun. It was six days of passage making, broken, to, broken into two passages, a two-day one and a four-day one. When I first got there, um, we spent two weeks just cruising in the San Blas Archipelago. And if you want to picture the San Blas, just close your eyes and think of, an, of the perfect tropical paradise. And you'll see white sandy beaches and turquoise water and palm trees swaying in the breeze. That's the San Blas Archipelago in Panama. So I got a chance to cruise with them and get exposed to cruising culture. Um, one of the things that happens in when there's a concentration of cruisers is there's a morning radio network. We call them the, the cruiser nets. And everybody gets on and you sort of announce themselves, announce yourself, you know, who's new, who's leaving, who's got a broken boat and needs to borrow a part or needs to find somebody that knows how to adjust the valves on a diesel or whatever it may be. When's the barbecue on the beach? Everybody bring your own beer, you know. Um, so that was fun. And um, I, I found that the cruising culture is really a, a big part of the fun. Uh, it's really a community. Uh, I call it a small town where the houses move, right? Because you you know everybody in the, in the little village, but then these guys go off that way and they go off that way. And then eventually you all bump into each other in another anchor. It's super fun. But um, this, the video here is showing a day when we were going downwind, 30 knot winds. We had about 10 foot wind waves coming from behind. So great, it's pushing us in the right direction. But there was also a 10 foot swell coming in from the east. And those two 10 foot sets of waves would hit and interfere with each other and create this washing machine effect, right? And the other two crew got pretty seasick. I've, I'm fortunate that I don't really get seasick very easily. Um, they looked at it as it's worth it because we love this lifestyle and we love where we're going and where we've been. Um, I just love sailing in the ocean. It's actually my favorite part of the whole thing. But I think it's really important, or at least it's a good idea, that if you're moving down this path, before you commit to a cru cruising lifestyle, get out on the ocean and see how you feel about it. Do you get seasick? Do you love it? Are you terrified? Um, and if you're doing this as a couple, it's a good idea for your partner to get out there too. There's lots of stories of uh, people that have spent a bunch of money on the on a boat and they've gotten all ready to go cruising and they're planning to go out for a couple of years. They might've even sold their house. And then they sail out the Strait of Juan de Fuca down to San Francisco, sell the boat and never get on the water again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so fast forward again, now it's 2015 and it's my turn to take Priya out and turn left. Turning, turning left is what we call going out the Strait of Juan de Fuca. You turn left and head toward Mexico. So uh, what was going on is I had a job in, uh, at a software company in um, Santa Clara, California. And I decided to sail Priya down there and use her as my kind of uh, home away from home when I was down there on business trips. Actually, that's just an excuse. I wanted to go sail to San Francisco. <laughs> so I rounded up three of my sailing buddies. Uh, one of them is here in the room, this guy, Sven. And uh, we headed down to, um, to San Francisco. Ended up keeping the boat in Half Moon Bay, um, California, which is just south of San Francisco uh, on the ocean side. And what really struck me uh, that kind of surprised me is, although I had built a lot of confidence sailing down the coast, I was kind of daunted by the, how am I gonna get the boat back up the coast? Because the, the prevailing weather blows from the Northwest and the currents push the same direction. And we just had, we had a pretty, uh, pretty rowdy ride on the way down. Uh, this video is of that trip. This is approaching um, uh, Cape Mendocino. So to get to San Francisco, you've got to go by two major capes, Cape Blanco in Oregon and Cape Mendocino in Northern California. They're notorious for 
uh, big wind, big waves. Um, and so you really want to watch the weather. We're about 100 miles offshore. The forecast for the Cape, uh, we're about a day out. And the forecast is for 30 knot northerlies and 10 foot seas, which is sporty, but um, just fun and kind of perfect. Um, you're not going to get much better us weather usually at the, at the Cape. So we set up for it. Um, we've got a double reef mainsail and a storm jib there. So we you know, reduced our amount of sail area to be able to handle the heavy wind. When we got there, it was blowing uh, like 35 gusting to 39. So it's blowing a gale. The winds were, or sorry, the waves were 15 feet high and, and breaking on the top. And of course, this is all happening at night because that's when it happens. Uh, but the boat did fine. It was going like a rocket. And by going like a rocket, it was doing seven knots. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, it averaged its hull speed. So hull, theoretical hull speed is how fast can the boat go without planing? This is not a planing boat. But because of the big waves, it's surfing down the waves. So anyway, uh, we had a fantastic time. The, the night was perfectly clear. The first half of the night was a full moon. So you could see all the waves in their glory. Uh, and then the moon set and the Milky Way came out. And if you haven't seen the Milky Way from a hundred miles offshore, guess what? You haven't seen the Milky Way. It's, it's amazing. Uh, not only that, but as our eyes adjusted, the bioluminescence in the sea became visible. So now you've got this glow in the dark green sea with these bright green breakers on the top of the big waves. I mean, it was just otherworldly. We have dolphins the next morning. Yes. Do you want to tell that part of the story? Uh, oh, wait, you can't. You're, you're not mic'd up. Memorable day of my life. We were, um, Grant was below because he skippered it. And um, he, he was sleeping. And the, and we were in, the, the wind had died down, but the waves were still really big, 15-foot waves. And the porpoises found the boat and were playing in the uh, bow wave. And I had this really strange experience of looking up at porpoises swimming through the water. Wow. It was really cool. And that was uh, about a day and a half after we came across a sperm whale and he stopped to let us go by. Yeah. Right? Okay. There's amazing things happen out in the ocean. Okay, so uh, finally, um, in 2016, I sailed back north, uh, left the software startup, and um, wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. But coming north, so I mentioned, you know, I was a little daunted because we had just gone through this gale past the Cape. Now I got to go the other way. But what you do, back to this idea of climate weather windows and weather windows. So the climate window for going south on this coast is summer, basically July through September. The climate window for coming north is April. And that's because the Pacific high pressure system that creates all that northwest weather hasn't really set up yet. And there's lots of little low pressure systems that roll through and you get southerlies. Uh, and so what I did is I rounded up about, it was, I forget it was five or six crews. One of the crews back there, Bill, uh, thanks for coming. And we, uh, we did it in hops from harbor to harbor going up the coast. And we were able to do all of those hops downwind going north, except for one off the Oregon coast. And there's a story about that I'll maybe tell during the Q&A. Um, where am I? Oh yeah, so um, I came back here and I was surprised uh, to get a, uh, invited to step in uh, to a job at the Center for Wooden Boats. And so that gave me a uh, chance to just continue to boost my sailing network. This is a fantastic place if you want to meet sailors and boaters of all kinds. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, and I also started really getting serious about outfitting for a long-term voyage. Um, and I finally, in the fall of 2019, so three years later, announced that I would be retiring in the spring and uh, sailing to Mexico in the summer of 2020. Um, Probably needless to say, I didn't sail south in 2020, although a few boats did. Um, but that gave me a, a chance to, to sort a few things out. 
Um, so I was retired. I ended up just cruising around Puget Sound. During, when we were all supposed to stay at home, I stayed at home. My home was a boat, so I was living on it. So I just sailed around. Uh, also went through some restructuring. And for me, that meant um, kind of downsizing my real estate, moving out of Seattle and moving to Port Townsend where I decided I wanted to live. Uh, and I bring that up because when you get to the kind of cutting the dock lines point where you're gonna go off on a long-term cruise, it might make sense to do a little restructuring. Sometimes people will rent out their house. They're gonna go for a couple of years. Sometimes they just sell and go sailing and figure out the rest of it later. Or if you're renting, you just you know take off. Um, so that's, that's a part of the game as well. And continued outfitting the boat. So I could spend several hours talking about outfitting the boat. Um, for me, the approach I took since I used, I bought a boat in 97 and I'm still sailing that boat is I, I took 25 years to outfit the boat. So there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of money being spent, but it was spent over a 25 year period while I was working. Um, I, I'm still outfitting the boat, by the way, this never stops. I got, I got south and realized I needed another solar panel. So now I got to get that through Mexican customs. That'll be fun. Um, but, you know, the, the big, the really big project was in 2015 when I was getting ready to sail out into the ocean, uh, pulled the mast out of the boat, replaced all the standing rigging, all the running rigging. Um, and I've done a number of things to kind of beef up the boat. It's a, it's a good solid ocean boat to begin with, but <clears throat> it's nice to be really confident that your boat's not going to break. Um, and by the way, they still break. That's, that's part of the thing. And being, being prepared to fix them and handle situations, handle emergency situations is, is part of what you want to learn. Another reason why you want to sail with other people that have lots of experience, right? But finally, uh, in August of last year, I got to turn left again. And uh, the video here is us sailing out the Strait, Strait of Juan de Fuca, literally sailing off into the sunset. Uh, and what, so I joined this thing called the Coho Ho Ho Rally. It's a cruising rally. Uh, and there's a bunch of these around the world that are kind of for different voyages. This one uh, goes from uh, Seattle to San Francisco. And what it is, there's a series of seminars that you can attend. And the seminars are on everything from offshore weather to offshore communications to uh, cooking on a boat, uh, different kinds of maintenance issues. So all useful topics as you're getting ready to go off on a big long-term voyage. Um, the other thing is, th th and the thing that I really found the most satisfying about it was it's a way to connect with the community that's getting ready to go join the fleet of, of world cruisers, right? Um, there were about a dozen boats last year. I think there's like 16 or 17 boats in the rally this year, and they're all taken off at the end of this month uh, or thereabouts. Um, so it was a three month delivery down to La Paz uh, in the Sea of Cortez. And um, the reason it's three months is, is back to climate windows. So I mentioned before, you know, July, August, September is when you wanna to go to San Francisco. You don't wanna enter Mexico until November after the hurricane season's over. So that leaves a couple of months to cruise uh, the California coast. And just another video. Um, videos don't do waves justice, but if you can see how hard it is for me to hold the camera still, that might give you an idea of what was going on. Uh, this is somewhere off the Oregon coast. And after th of three, three times I've gone down the coast, this was, last year was the biggest waves that we had. We had a, um, a predominant three, two to three meter northwesterly swell, or I guess you call it a southeasterly swell, coming from the northwest. Uh, and that was manageable, but there was also an occasional four meter swell that would roll in from the west and just rock the boat around like crazy. But, but it was a fun ride. So there were four legs uh, and I lined up four different crews to join me. The first one was Seattle to Half Moon Bay. And that's uh, Jeremy Dinsel and Kristen Peterson there on the left and Jen Wensrich on the right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, uh, Kristen and Jeremy are CWBers, and, and Jen uh, was a friend of Kristen's that she had sailed before. But we all, um, all had a lot of sailing experience. Three of us had ocean sailing experience. So I felt really good about um, taking this crew out on what is one of the most challenging stretches of water that you can sail on. 
But then it was time for the California Coastal Cruise. And so uh, is Jen still here? No. Jen, the lady who set up all the food over here, uh, Jen Sarto, who works here at CWB, and Melanie Masson, who's uh, the development director here and also gave the talk on the racing, getting into racing last month, uh, joined me from Half Moon Bay to Morro Bay, California, stopping in uh, Santa Cruz and um, uh, Monterey along the way. And then I've got a good friend that I've known since uh, sixth grade who came out from Colorado um, named Greg. And we did the cruise from Morro Bay down into the um, Channel Islands in Southern California, stopping at Avalon on Santa Catalina Island. And then finally, Kristen uh, came back and joined me again along with their mom, uh, Lori Peterson, and then uh, Bob Curley. And I had sailed uh, uh, on a racing boat along with Wim and other friends with, uh, with Lori and Bob and a little bit with Kristen. So fantastic crew, a lot of fun. Everybody had a good time. And then this is where I found myself in the Sea of Cortez. And this is just three of the beautiful anchorages uh, that I was in. This one's called Agua Verde. It's a little um, oasis around the corner from the, the bay. That one's called Los Gatos. And that is across from Loreto. And uh, the colors, are, do the projector does not do justice to the colors. That was the most spectacular sunset I've ever seen. One of the realities of cruising, and I mentioned this before about boat maintenance in exotic locations. For the first four weeks that I was in La Paz, uh, my job was to fix the boat. Um, this is a exhaust, it's called an exhaust elbow. So this is the exhaust from the boat. This, you can see the little break here, that's not good. Um, that was the fix, but I, there were probably um, 20, a list of like 25 things that I had to fix on the boat. And that's just, that's just part of the game. So next season, uh, my plan is to go back down. The boat is uh, in, it's on hard in a boatyard in San Car Carlos in storage. So we'll splash it and sail it down the West Coast to Zihuatanejo and back. And then I'll be back for another six months in the summer. And then the following year, go back to San Carlos again, sail to Costa Rica and Panama. And after that, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Maybe go into the Caribbean, maybe go across the Pacific, maybe back to Mexico. The great thing about this lifestyle is you get to decide. Yeah. I just have one question. Crossing into Mexico, what's the paperwork like? Is that a half a day job to get the boat there or is it two days? Good question. So the question is, uh, how much time are you going to spend on dealing with paperwork to get into Mexico with the boat? And um, it sort of depends where you go in and how uh, you approach it. I had heard that it was not terrible, but kind of tedious. So I went to a marina um, that had a guy that I could hire that, that was a Mexican guy um, who, this is one of the things he does for a living. So he took me in. It ended up taking a morning. So it was like two hours, two, two and a half hours. All right, so almost done with the slides, uh, but this is an important one. So you've seen the way that I did, you know, how I got into this lifestyle and kind of where I'm at in the process. That's one way to do it. So I'm, I'm a single-hander. I'm a single-hander who loves to have crew, especially on passages, uh, but even just to come play with me and, you know, enjoy it. That's, it's, the experiences are more fun shared. So last year I had... Um, 10 different groups joined me, you know, four getting down the coast and another six in the Sea of Cortez. This next year, I've got a dozen lined up. And so that's gonna be fun. The vast majority of cruisers are double-handed. It's a couple. And um, the even if you have two people, so it's possible to do like this, the Seattle to San Francisco run with two people, but it's tiring. And particularly if there's bad weather, it can be really exhausting. It can actually be dangerous. So a lot of these, Couples are looking for people to go out and crew. So if you reach the point where you know, you know your way around a sailboat, um, there's opportunities every year to get on a boat and crew with them and get that experience before you do it yourself. There's quite a few kid boats out there. They tend to flock together so the kids can play. Uh, you can cruise as crew. Um, I mentioned my experience in Panama, right? Where I had two weeks before we did the passage. Uh, this lady on the, uh, the boat pictured here is my friend Christina Hinman. And Christina came down to cruise with me for a couple of weeks, 
going north in the Sea of Cortez. And then I had another crew coming in, uh, these two guys and, and a couple other people. Um, and uh, so Christina had to get off the boat, but she wasn't done. Fortunately, Cheryl was there with her boat and she was getting ready to head south back to La Paz. So Christina just hopped from Priya onto Cheryl's boat and got another month of cruising in. And that's a thing. I mean, you, you could go down there and just get on those morning nets. And, the, and one of the standing topics is rides and crew. Anybody need a ride? Anybody looking for crew? And you could just do that and just cruise around that way. At least in Mexico, that would work. Uh, there's snowboarding and working off season. Um, a really fun couple named Mac and Jenny Fraley uh, and their dog Disco on uh, the sailboat Maya are doing this. Um, he does uh, marine electrical work and she's in healthcare. So they're back here um, working, saving up some money and then they'll go back down and their boat's down in Mexico, they'll pick it up. Working while cruising, I, I met another couple uh, that were working full time. They just needed to be where there was cell phone access so he could get high speed internet during the week and then they'd move around on the weekends. So there's all different ways to, to make this happen. You could take a sabbatical like I did or leave of absence to go to Alaska. Um, or you could wait until you're retired and then take off forever, uh, but you don't have to. All right, last, last slide. So back to the, the five stages, right? And you saw they didn't all happen necessarily in order for me, uh, but you know, get started, get, start with a small boat, preferably get out there, build up your sailing network, get experiences, buy a boat, then get gradually bigger adventures and you're cruising along the way. You're not waiting until the end, right? Uh, but at some point you might find that you're ready to cut the dock lines. All right. That's my little talk. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Any questions? How's, how's your Spanish when you're getting plummets? Muy poco, muy poco. Uh, it's coming along, but slowly. How much did you have before you started? How much Spanish did you have when you went down there? Uh, I had studied, so I had used Duolingo for years and learned very little. And then I started following a podcast called uh, Coffee Break Spanish and started to actually sort of understand Spanish. Um, and I sort of understood the idea of verb conjugation and you know some of these things, but um, memorizing all of the different conjugations and tenses and things like that is still beyond me. But what I found when I, so when I, when I did the four weeks of fixing the boat in La Paz, um, I had to speak Spanish because you go into a hardware store in La Paz, nobody's speaking English. So, I mean, until you get immersed, right? Yes. Oh, excellent. Oh, so the question is, uh, how much time uh, do I spend docked versus how much time um, uh, in marinas and what my monthly expenses are? So um, I'll, I don't know that I really want to show what my monthly expenses are, but I do know um, that people are cruising for as little as $30,000 a year full-time or less. Uh, and you can spend millions of dollars if you know, so everything in that range. For me, um, my budget doesn't allow me to stay in marinas all the time. And marinas are expensive in Mexico and they're expensive in Central America, uh, at least in Costa Rica. I'm not sure about Panama. Uh, they're about as expensive as they are here or maybe even a little bit more so. There's not very many of them and they're very, very full. So I pretty much lived at Anchor. Uh, I went into a marina for one week uh, once I got into Mexico. On the, way, on the way south, I actually, we stayed in a marina in Monterey for eight days or something like that, right? Um, and that marina wasn't too expensive. For, for Priya, it was like $45 a day, which is really cheap. But down in La Paz, I think it was like $125 a day. Um, so it adds up pretty quickly. Yes. Even though you don't get seasick, do you have some observations about um, your experience with your 
Yeah, so the question is, uh, even though I don't get seasick, do I have observations about the seasickness, seasickness experience with others? Um, so on taking flight, the whole family would get would get seasick, and they would they would use you know like the scopolamine patches, and there's also a a, a seasickness um, medicine you can get in Mexico that you can't get here uh, called Sturgeron, um, and that would help, but they would still find that uh, it took a day or two to kind of get over it, and I think this is pretty common that a lot of people go out, you get seasick for the first couple of days, and then you're fine. And for that reason, those people tend to like long passages, because if you just have a two or three day passage and then another one, you're seasick all the time. So you do a week long passage and you got five days where you're not, where you're not sick. Um, I find that for me, seasickness is a matter of disorientation. And so if I start to feel disoriented, I do something to not get disoriented. Like, Stare at the horizon is the classic thing. Driving the boat is a really good idea. Um, so there are, and stay hydrated and stay well fed. You know, so there's things you can do to, to manage it as well. Another question from the internet. What's the best burger of fruit food that I had in port? Uh, there's a couple of ways to answer that question. Actually, one of the best burgers I ever had was just down at um, the Tides in uh, Gig Harbor. And it was because it was during the COVID lockdown and I was sailing in the South, South Sound and I pulled in and they were open and they were serving. So they have, they have a place where you can come in and dock. And then I could go up to the back of the restaurant and they would serve me a burger. So the first burger I had in couple of months <laughs> but that's probably not what the question meant to, meant to ask um i mean the you know it's mexico there's tacos uh the tacos are awesome um we did catch a yellowfin tuna off the Mex mexican coast and that was pretty tasty for about four or five meals um i learned to make oh so i had this in a restaurant in Ciudad cortez and then i learned to make it, it became my signature dish which is uh, camarones al ajillo, which is shrimps sauteed in olive oil with lots of garlic and uh, red peppers over rice. What else? <laughs> Any questions? What are your solar panels? Are those pretty much powering all your electronics on board now? Yeah, um, this, I have, Right now, 440 watts, and I'm bringing another 115 watts down. Oh, sorry. Um, you're right. I did miss one. The question was, uh, what's my solar setup, and does it power all the electronics and stuff? And so, um, yeah, about half a megawatt of power. Um, what surprised me was, I'm, I'm way down south in Mexico, but it's December, and the sun's still way low on the horizon, and is only up for 10 and a half hours. I had tested my solar panels in Puget Sound in June when we have 16 hours of sun. So I was a little surprised that I needed a little bit more power, but basically it did, it did power everything I needed, including the fridge, which is the big energy hog, uh, except in December and the first part of January. And I think by getting up to, you know, it's gonna be 500, 555 watts or something like that. I think that'll be enough to just power everything. And then you just run it off the battery for the rest of the like, yeah, night. Yeah, right. Off, it runs off batteries during the night. Yeah, there's a question over here. In your several decades of being on the ocean, have you noticed any evidence of climate change, either in ocean patterns or rock climate? So the, the biggest difference that I've noticed is weather is getting harder to predict. Um, I think that the weather model data, and I'm not a meteorologist, uh, but I think the weather model data is based on years and years and years of, of past history, and it doesn't work as well. That's my, that's my personal take. Again, I'll qualify that. I'm not a meter meteorologist. Yes? You said that you had done some water system as one of your improvements. Do you know about desalination, or what, what is your water system for? Yeah, the question is, what do we do for water on board? And so um, when I... Outfitted the boat for the Alaska cruise back in 2000. I got a water maker that was, uh, so it's a desalinator. 
that was three gallons per hour. And that was fine for that cruise. Um, but living aboard for months at a time, um, I upgraded to a eight gallon per hour water maker. And that uses, no, get technical on it, but that uses a fair amount of power. Uh, and there's kind of a trick to running it during, there's a time of the day when the batteries aren't able to accept as much charge and there's a bunch of sunshine. So that's when I run the water maker. So there's a whole power optimization uh, thing that you, you kind of figure out uh, as you go. Uh, but I'm able to make all the water that I, that I need. I typically use about five gallons a day per person. You just jump in the water to bathe, right? Internet question. Can we go back one slide? Yes. Say that again. Like, what would you say the quote unquote risks are of purchasing an obnoxious cruiser? Purch so the question was what are the risks of purchasing a production cruiser to go cruising in the Caribbean? Is that it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, it totally depends on the production cruiser. So the, the newer, the newer production boats are generally fairly well built. Um, some better than others. And I, I don't want to start a controversy by naming specific brands that I like and don't like, because there's a whole religious thing that happens with that. Um, <laughs> but um, it, an older boat, it's interesting. So if you have a fiberglass boat in the 1970s, you can't destroy it. They're overbuilt. They're super strong. Uh, my boat was built in the mid eighties and it, it's pretty stout, um, but there were some weak points. And through my sailing the boat hard, I found those weak points. Um, so get a good surveyor. Um, Did you break the bow and the stern of, of that boat at some point? Okay. So there's a question in the room. Did I break the bow and the stern of the boat? And he was on the boat when I broke the stern. So um there's a couple of us who know about the bow. yeah so and i gotta tell these <laughs> i gotta tell these stories so back in 2013 um my friend sven and i uh were sailing north in the inside passage and uh we're in a little body of water called chancellor channel which is near um uh, well it's in, in between vancouver island and the mainland let's put it that way and it's notorious for strong wind blowing and it was it was blowing like 25 knots and i had a dinghy hanging on davits on the back of the boat and the pounding of the dinghy bashing through these waves caused the transom to crack. Um, wasn't dangerous. Um, it was expensive. Um, and, but after that, I, I reinforced the transom um, with more layers of fiberglass. And later on, I actually reinforced, I get really super beefy hardware for the backstay, which is the, the cable that holds up the mast from the back of the boat. So, um, yeah, so that's one. The other, the other story um, is perhaps more entertaining, at least for me. Uh, sailing, I mentioned coming back from California up the coast in Priya to Seattle, uh, that one day we were going upwind. Uh, I don't know if Kristen and Jeremy on, are online, but Kristen Peterson was among my crew. We had, there were three of us. And so we sailed through the night. It was a 36 hour passage. Everything was fine at night. Two hours before we got to Newport, Oregon, we're kind of bashing upwind in 25 knots of wind and about six, eight foot seas. And I had installed in that big rigging project in 2015, I had installed what's called a solent stay, which is a, you have the head stay, which is the wire that goes from the bow to the top of the mast. Solent stay is about 18 inches after that parallel and it allows you to fly different sails. So we had a, a smaller sail that's good for going upwind in strong wind. And there was a small engineering problem. Um, we were relying on the strength of the hull deck joint, which is where the deck is attached to the hull. Wasn't strong enough. So we came off a big wave and the deck popped off. The bow was still attached, but it's about a one inch seam on both sides of the boat. So, but we were only a couple of hours out. We dropped the sails, we motored in, went to a automobile store, automotive store and bought uh, ratchet straps and strap the deck back on the boat. <laughs> I didn't put the sails up for the rest of the trip, but motored back to Port Townsend and fixed the rig. So now um, there's this super reinforced bow that you could basically break ice with. Um, 
work your way up. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Another internet. Was I worried about foodborne illnesses? Um, not even a little bit, not even a little bit. Um, the food, at least where I've been so far uh, in Mexico has been uh, very good. The water's good. I mean, I'm drinking super pure water. Um, I think if I was, well, I mean, I stayed with a friend in, in San Carlos and, and drank tap water and nobody got sick. Um, I think it depends where you are. You know, if you're maybe in some of the smaller towns out in more rural areas, I'd be more concerned. But the whole Montezuma's Revenge thing seems to be less of an issue than it was in 1975 when my family traveled there and I got it. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, I'm not very experienced with that. I'm seeing those pictures of the time. So how do you tell when they go about the level of fun and to when you really so if i understood that so the question is you're out in the sea it's getting sporty right. and at what point does it cease being fun and start being dangerous yeah. right excellent question um there's kind of a lot to answer that but it's First of all, I think the skip this, you don't want to go beyond the skipper's competence level or, or the crew's competence level. Um, but each crew is going to have a, a different competence level. And so the skipper has to be aware of that. So if it's seasickness and somebody's becoming unhealthy, if somebody's getting really dehydrated and maybe they're getting a fever or, you know, they're starting to really, um, it's hard to tell too, because they'll start to get, um, you get seasick and you get, um, uh, tired and don't do much. So how, how bad is it? Right. So you got to talk to people and, and kind of judge that. Um, there's also hypothermia. Um, so I've been sailing with people that I thought were fine, but they really didn't have enough clothes on. This is more here than in Mexico. Um, and realized they were getting hypothermic and they had to get them below and get a blanket on them and, and warm them up. So you, you really just have to kind of keep tabs on it, pay attention. Um, it's an important thing for for the skipper to do and it really everybody should be doing it for each other but it is the skipper's responsibility to make sure they're keeping tabs on it and then there's the whole are, are we getting into conditions that the boat can't handle well it's hard to get into conditions that the boat can't handle the boat can usually handle way more than the crew uh, but but it could still happen and there's a whole sequence of uh steps you can take to get the boat uh, ready to handle stronger and stronger conditions, bigger waves, more wind and so forth. Uh, but that would be the whole a subject of another whole talk. Good question. Thanks. You guys want to keep going? More questions? Well, how much of, you mentioned water. How much of the water that you drink on the boat is from the water maker versus filling the tank otherwise? The question is how much of the water I drink on the boat is from the water maker versus other sources? It's all from the water maker. And because of that, I don't get any minerals in my water. So I make sure and take a multivitamin so I can get minerals. Michael. Could you reflect a little on your technique for sound like you spend a lot of time shooting crew? Could you get some more about how that's going to be that? So the question is, how do I go about choosing crew? Um, that's another good question. Um, it depends on, on what I'm doing. So a, a lot of what I try to do is to match the crew to the particular leg of the voyage. So I mentioned that for my Seattle to San Francisco run last year, I had four of us all experienced sailors, three of which had ocean, ocean sailing experience. And that's because the potential of getting into dicey situations was high compared to other legs. Um, and if, you know, we were sailing in these four, four meter swells with the two and, a, two and three meter swells crossing, big kind of rowdy seas, I had crew that were competent and comfortable to stay on board on a solo watch so that I could go below and sleep, right? On the other hand, um, 
cruising some of the you know harbor hopping from Anchorage to Anchorage in the Sea of Cortez. Um, I it might be we had two weeks to get a distance that could be traveled in three or four days. So you could pick weather windows and the conditions weren't going to be very extreme. So in that case, I could have somebody that had uh, much less experience, but maybe was still a sailor because we're going to do a lot of sailing. Some of the trips I did out of La Paz, where I would just go to the neighboring anchorages and then come back into the town. I had people on the boat that weren't crew at all, really. They're just, they're guests. They don't know how to sail, but they're just there to have a good time. And I'm, that's great because I want to have a good time with them. So matching to matching the crew's kind of competence and comfort level to the conditions I'm anticipating is a big part of it. But there's got to be a lot more to the Is there a lot more to it than that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a judgment thing. I mean, one of the things I do is particularly if it's going to be an offshore passage is that I need you to tell me if you've got any health conditions that might be an, might be an impact on the passage, right? Because I, mean, I need to know, you know, what, what the potential risk is and, um, um, Compatibility of personality is important because you are kind of in a space capsule and you're going to be in each other's face for a long time. And I think a lot about when I'm, because a lot of times my crews are mix, a mix of people that might not even know each other. So I got to think about how they're going to get along together on the boat and how I'm going to get along with them. Yeah, Bill, you had a question? You probably haven't done this, but when you're in those tumultuous seas and, you know, do you ever... Um, like just hold to you just drop the sails, or do you need power to constantly go forward, even no matter how bad the seas are? Do you ever consider the possibility of just, I'm going to put this thing, we put a sea anchor, and I'm just going to drift for a bit. Okay. The things calm down. Another really good question. So the question is uh, have, I, have I ever, or do I ever uh, consider just kind of stopping the boat? Uh, because the conditions are really, really rough. And, you know, how do you do that? I'm paraphrasing, right? So I, what I try to do is I try to imagine every conceivable set of conditions that I could find myself in with the boat and ask myself the question, do I have the skill and the equipment required to deal with that? So it starts with, you've got all your sails up, the wind gets strong, you start shortening sail. The wind gets stronger, you shorten sail some more. Shorten sail just means reduced sail area. It might mean changing a sail or putting a reef in a sail. Um, and the amount of sail area you can carry uh, is dependent on the point of sail you're on. So if you're going downwind, you can carry more sail. So if I'm going upwind and I've shortened sail down to my storm sails and it's still too much, it's time to go downwind. Unless we're on a lee shore and downwind is toward rocks. <laughs> so then I do carry a sea anchor and a drogue, which are devices. The sea anchor parks you in the water and you drift with the current. Uh, it's a big parachute, right? And a drogue is like a little parachute that you hang off the back of the boat. And it tends to steady the boat so you can surf down the waves without getting out of control. Uh, and then if all else fails, um, I have a life raft. I have an EPIRB, which is a beacon I can flip off and uh, or flip on. And if I flipped it off, I probably wouldn't do anything. But I flip it on and the Coast Guard comes and gets me, uh, unless I'm in the middle of the Pacific, in which case some container ship is going to come and get me. Um, and I have other communications, satellite, uh, satellite phone and, you know, different stuff. Uh, so that in a dire emergency, you know, we've got a way to survive. What do I have to, what do I have to give up? What do I not like about cruising? Um, I'm not crazy about diving the boat every couple of weeks and scraping the barnacles off the hull, <laughs> but it's not terrible. You know, it's swimming, swimming in a cloud of bottom paint, but it's swimming. Um, so that's not great. Um, you know, I got to, well, I don't have to, a lot of times I'll, I'll hike to get my groceries. 
and then schlep them back like a mule, right? You don't have to do that. You could you could get an Uber or a Didi in La Paz for like two dollars. So that's not too bad. I gotta really reach to find, I mean it's it's a lot of work, but I enjoy the work. So I don't know. Who else? What what's not to like about cruising? Coming back home. Coming back home, coming back home is pretty fun. Except when you come back to Seattle in May of 2022 and it's freezing. You still crew and you know you skip yourself, but you still crew with other people's boats. Question is, do I still crew with other people's boats? And the answer is I'd I'd love to, um, but I'm spending so much time on my own boats that I guess so I have a little Nordic folk boat, you know this, um, that I keep in Port Townsend. And so mostly I'm getting people on my boats, but I do really enjoy crewing with others. And um, I have uh, several of the crew, and again, Kristen, if you're watching, I will keep my promise. Um, the crew that crewed with me, the expectation is when they need crew, I'm available, right? You took a trip through Panama last week. You went to the Caribbean at one point? Yeah, the question was a uh, trip through Panama and the Caribbean. So I was talking about that earlier with taking flight. Oh, okay. Was that on? Okay. Yeah. That was that video of the 10 foot crossing waves. And... Yeah. You said we were glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam Blass. That's the islands. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope you had a good time.